name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I know we're a little bit tight today because there's no children's liturgy, so if you have a spot next to you, just kind of scooch in, get close. Hopefully the person you're next to took a shower this morning, and we'll just get everybody who's on the side a seat. So today's gospel is one that we're very familiar with. We read it not only in the Holy 50, but we read it also in the Great Lent. And, and it's a beautiful gospel um, because to be able to see it within like, and through the lens of the Great Lent, but also to be able to see the same gospel and the same person through the lens of the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. Because we, when we look at the Samaritan woman, we see in, in her initial conversation with our Lord at the well, it was a period of repentance. It was a period of, of confession. But instead of staying in her current state, which her current state was she, was she had a reputation within the city that she lived in as having five husbands, and she was so embarrassed by her reputation that instead of going to the well early in the morning, which is what everybody traditionally did because the sun wasn't up and the heat wasn't there. She was going in the middle of the day when the heat was the worst. So because of her reputation, her repentance, her feeling sorry for herself, and her coping mechanism of it was to hide. She hid. She hid in the heat of the day when nobody else would be outside. That's where she hid. And it was torturous. That was, that was her like repentance every day when she would go in the middle of the day. Why was she doing that? Because she was reminded of her sin. She was reminded of the mistakes that she had made. It was a daily reminder to her. Every day she got up, everybody went in the morning, she stayed, she grabbed her water pot in the afternoon, and she started to walk to the well. That water pot in the heat of the day was a reminder of what she was doing, of how she was living. And then when she met our Lord and they had their conversation and he asked him and he, and he asked her very upfront saying, go call your husband. If you want this living water, go call your husband. And she responded, I have no husband. And he said, rightly you have said because you've had five husbands. That moment of truth, that ability to you know, begin to bear everything was the point, the starting point of her conversion. It was a starting point where she was Yes, the Samaritan woman, but she, came, she went on to be, I believe, St. Fotini is her name in the church, the way we recognize her. It was a conversion point at the well where truth met love, where truth met mercy. And so we, foc we tend to focus on that during Lent. But now we have an opportunity in light of the resurrection, in light of of the victory and the power that our Lord has given us through His own resurrection, we now have the ability to see the same story and the same person through a different lens, through a much clearer lens. Because it's, it's nice, and although repentance and confession has its due place in our lives, sometimes we, we stay just in that repentance and confession and feeling sorry and down and the guilt and the shame. But the Samaritan woman told, shows us today that there is a time for celebration. There's a time to be free. Not to minimize the importance and the role of repentance and confession and, and seeing the truth in our lives doesn't minimize that. But what it does is it takes us through that into a time of joy, a time of victory, a time of freedom. And our Lord made a distinction like that there, this is an important time. Because many people said, well, how come your disciples don't fast? Well, how can they fast when I'm with them? This is a time for them to enjoy me. It's not a time to fast. There will be a day to fast. There will be a day that they need to abstain. But right now when I'm with them, this is a time where they don't fast. The church also, we recognize the same thing. We recognize and say that there is a time where we don't fast, which is the Holy 50. Because we want to celebrate. We want to enjoy. We want to be able to walk freely.
But there's an irony in this story. Like, I'll be honest, I read the Samaritan woman, and I read it out of jealousy. I read it out of jealousy. Because as a Samaritan, like, as I read the Samaritan woman, and I realize, like, she had a life full of problems, bad choices, mistakes. I have the same life. I have the same mistakes. I carry guilt and shame just like she carried guilt and shame. She met our Lord at the well. I meet our Lord on the altar every week. She left the well and she was free. Sometimes I leave the church. I feel like I'm leaving in handcuffs. And I ask, like, well, what's the difference? I go to my father confession. I confess my sins. I repent. I leave the office in handcuffs. There was some, there's something clearly different between me and the Samaritan woman. She clearly left the meeting with, the, with our Lord a completely different person. And maybe you can kind of share with me in my struggle that sometimes I'm coming here and I'm meeting the Lord either in, in repentance and confession or at the altar, taking of his body and blood, and I feel like I'm leaving in handcuffs. And I feel that when I walk around, I feel like I'm still hiding. I feel like if I look to the person next to me, I ask myself, what would this person think of me if they knew really what was going on? But see, when we look at the Samaritan woman, she displayed something completely different. After she met with our Lord, Truth came out. Healing occurred. Forgiveness of sins occurred. She went back to the same city. And she not only proclaimed, but she proclaimed to the men. She, complained, she, co she proclaimed what the Lord had done to the very men who were the thorn in her side. The cause, not the cause, but a part of the problem that was leading her to carry her water pot at noon every day. When I look at what she did, the courage she had to go and proclaim what she did, I have no choice but to say, she's free, and I'm living in handcuffs. And I say, well, what's, something's missing. Something's missing from my story and her story. And I hope, like, you're also saying, okay, well, what's missing from her story and my story too. And I would say that yes, repentance is important. And yes, confession is important. And yes, taking of the body and the blood is important. But there's something she gained in that conversation, that very intimate conversation with our Lord, that we in present day society struggle with and it's the idea of acceptance it's the idea that if I come forward transparently how would people see me how would they accept me do so you sit next to like a new friend that you're meeting for the first time and you're beginning this conversation on this road to friendship. You don't come out with everything. Why? Because inside of you, there's a question. Is this person trustworthy? Is this person going to look at me different? Is this person going to not want to be my friend if they know this about me? As a child, I can sympathize and say growing up, and even now, when I look at my parents, and my life, like I've grown up, I have my own family, and I've done my own things. But sometimes I wonder if I tell my own mom and dad and say, you know what? This is what has happened to me. I may wonder and I may fear. Mom and dad look at me the same way. What about here in this church? And not just St. Mark's any church, the body of Christ, where we come and we, we together assemble. 
and we look to our right and we look to our left and we wonder, could I share? Could I open up? When we wonder if we can share and if we can open up, we wonder if, if I really say what's on the inside. Like, will this community accept me? We've missed the most important step of life. Because her acceptance didn't come from the community. Her acceptance came from our Lord. That even after admitting her sin to Him, that they continued on in this conversation. That He continued to speak with her. He continued to feed her. He continued to shower her with love. He didn't sugarcoat the truth. He dealt with the truth, but he dealt with it in a loving way. And he showed her what true acceptance was like. And out of a place of security and out of a place of acceptance came freedom. Out of a place of security, out of a place of acceptance came freedom. Freedom to say, I know a man who came and has told me everything I've ever done. To the very people that looked at her with such an evil eye. That's freedom. But because now all of a sudden her value in life shifted from what people would think, it shifted from what people would think, and now it was established in what the Lord thought of her and how the Lord accepted her, now there was foundation for her to stand because even if they all rejected her, even if they rejected her, she knew that they weren't my foundation. She knew and felt wholeheartedly that I stood, I now stand on the foundation that this man Jesus, he knows me in and out and he loves me. Do we come to church with that same understanding? Do we come to church seeking that same acceptance? We seek acceptance in all the wrong places. We seek acceptance from our friends, from our coworkers, from our parents. Now, I'm not saying all these are the wrong places, but they are never going to surmount to the acceptance we ultimately need to find from our Lord Jesus. Because the way He accepts us is very different. There's something very, very different in the conversation she had with our Lord than the conversation I may have with a friend who when I say something, they may say, it's okay, and I love you, and I hug. Although it's good, it is not the foundation for which I can go and share with the world what God has done. But how do we get to this place of acceptance? How do we find this acceptance? And unfortunately, like we live in a society right now where there is false acceptance being handed out. I don't even, I don't even want to count how many times a day we, we look for false acceptance. We look for false acceptance in like somebody to give us a good job. Okay, it's a confidence booster, but we're looking for acceptance. We're looking for somebody to value us. We look in, in, in different places. We look and seek relationships that we know in the long term won't be healthy, but in the short term make me feel good. What are we doing? We are looking for false acceptance. We are looking for a source of acceptance. I may be looking for acceptance in my different addictions, in an addiction to pornography, in an addiction to gambling, in an addiction to work and making money. I look for false acceptance through the different things that I have put into my life. But have those things. You have to ask your question, I ask my question. Have the things that I have put like in my life in order to gain acceptance from, have they given me the same freedom as a Samaritan woman? Have they given me the same freedom of the Samaritan woman? Let's look and let's, let's say like this is the power of the resurrection truly living in the life of someone that we meditate on, that we read about, 
every year, multiple times a year. She's, this, she's a standard. She shows us what true acceptance, what true power of resurrection is. Can I compare my life and say, do I live with that same amount of freedom? And if I don't live with that same amount of freedom, what things in my life have I put in and built in in order to give me this false sense of acceptance, this false sense of value? Because when we live off those foundations, we live handcuffed, unable to live freely. Let the rest of the world dictate who I should talk to, what I should do, where I should live, and what time of day I should go get water. She was a victim to her circumstances. She was a victim to the world around her who gave her a false sense of acceptance. And that world began to dictate what she did day in and day out. But the glory and the power of the resurrection is to break free of the handcuffs. But in order to match what this world is telling us is that accepts us, in order to match that and begin to decrease it, what we need to do is begin to fill our life in the presence of God. And three hours at church is not going to do it. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take repeatedly visiting certain verses, certain stories that reaffirm in our minds that I am accepted, that I am loved, that my value does not come from my job, nor my pay scale, nor my education, but my value comes solely, solely from God's love towards me. This woman had nothing, but she lived after this point as if she had everything completely free. Where are we? Are we handcuffed or are we accepted? You're the only one who can decide for you. But if you walk around, one of the tall tale signs that we walk around as if we are not accepted, we walk around hiding our insides. Hiding our secrets. Not to say you need to publicly announce your secrets, but we need not hide from them, but see how God is working through them. If we walk around hiding, then ask yourself, where do I seek acceptance from? Who am I seeking acceptance from? From this world or from Christ? As they offer two different kinds of acceptance very, very different. And the end result, we see the Samaritan woman, which is the story for all of us, and we see everything else. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Then he was pleased.